Um, thank you to those of you who are uh, joining us for this roundtable discussion. Um, we're going to spend this time uh, talking about shared learning as one of many levers uh, to motivate change towards advancing equity. Um, I'm Sophia. I am a team on the PES, or a member of the PESB team. Um, I can see Stacey laughing because he said virtual world. Can I talk? Who knows? Um, but I'm a program specialist on the preparation and credentialing team. Um, Leonie and Stacey, would you like to introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, I'm Leani Sherwin, and I am a um, program manager with PESB and um, work with Sophia on the prep and credentialing team, uh, and then with uh, Stacy um, on other projects. So. Um, yeah, Sophia, thanks for getting us started. And I was laughing in solidarity because I think it's, um, well, this is really rich conversation. It's um, getting to that time of day where we're all getting a little tired. So hopefully this will be a little bit um, more participatory uh, and get us all um, in the zone we need to be in. Oh, I didn't introduce myself. So <laughs> I'm Stacy Souders. I'm a program manager at PESB. I work on um, high school teacher academies. So the Recruiting Washington Teachers Program and Bilingual Educator Initiative. Awesome. Thanks, Stacey. And, um, and Leoni, as Stacey noted, this will hopefully be a little bit more participatory. Um, what is a roundtable discussion? Uh, basically, folks come together to talk about a specific topic, um, in this case, shared learning. And each person has an opportunity to participate, as illustrated by the idea of the circular layout of a roundtable. Um, so with that, we'll, Puzzy staff will go over some brief context, but most of this time is going to be open discussion to hear about each other's shared learning stories, ideas, and wonderings. All right, thanks, Sophia. Um, so I think we have um, just such a nice small group here. I think we can all do this just in uh, person. Um, but we'd like to take a moment to see who's in the room and have you introduce yourself with your pronouns, your organization, and the tribal land you're on. And I apologize, I forgot to include that in my introduction. Um, I do go by she, her. And I'm coming to you today from Gig Harbor, so the tribal lands of the Puyallup and Coast Salish people. Um, Sophia and Stacy, do you want to share your pronouns in tribal land as well? Sure. Um, I use she, her, and hers pronouns, and I am on the lands of the Coast Salish and Puyallup peoples. I also use she and her pronouns, and I am in Olympia on the traditional homelands of the Squaxin Island. Thank you. So now um, I'm just going to call who is in the participant list in the order I see them. And so when I call your name, if you could please just uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself, that would be great. Thank you. And so um, first up on my list is uh, Michelle Spencer. Hi, Michelle Spencer, Family Consumer Sciences Program Supervisor in Career and Technical Education at OSPI. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am on the traditional lands of the Puyallup tribe. Um, and next we have um, Ashley Beardsley. Hi, my name is Ashley Beardsley and I'm the seed assistant at Walla Walla University and I'm in Walla Walla. All right, and then um, Erica is also here from PESB. Erica, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Erica uh, Hernandez Scott, the DEI leadership and learning manager, she, her pronouns. And I am on the traditional traditional lands of the Squaxin Island tribe. Thank you, Erica. And then Erin. Hi, everybody. My name is Erin Peck. Uh, she, her pronouns. I work at PESBY as well, um, supporting communications across the agency. Um, and I am on the traditional lands of the Squaxin Island tribe. Uh, Jennifer Martinez. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Martinez. And my pronouns are she and her. I am with the Washington Alliance for Better Schools, where I am the Associate Director of Equity and Family Engagement. And I am on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish tribe. Um, but I am, my, my homeland is um, New Mexico, um, the Pueblo people and the um, uh, Apache. Thank you, Jennifer. And then um, we have, Julia Daniels. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Daniels. I'm a faculty member at Antioch University. My pronouns are she and her. Um, and I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the Duwamish people. 
Thank you, Julia. And then uh, finally, we have uh, Julie Casper. Hello, everyone. I'm Julie Casper, pronouns she and her. I'm with the Cary Institute for Global Good Center for Learning and Practice, where I'm the program manager for our Refugee Educator Academy. And I'm joining you from Tucson, Arizona, from the traditional and, and current lands of the Tohono O'odham and Yaqui peoples, as well as the traditional lands of the Apache. Thank you, Julie. I think we got everyone then. Well, we're um, so excited to have you all here uh, in the room with us today. And you'll notice I put our invitation to engage uh, in the chat earlier when we started. And I think we're gonna go ahead and move on and get started. So Leonie popped these in the um, chat and I think we've covered this in the morning, we covered it in the panel and it's just here as a reminder and just wanna move through this one so we actually do have time to engage. Um, and then on that note, we also um, have just seen this slide in the panel for those of you who are there. So our agency is focused on strengthening the educator workforce to support uh, each and every Washington student. And how do we do that? We hope that we do that collectively and collaboratively and through various channels, um, which are the topics of our roundtables today. So the purpose of the session is to focus specifically on shared learning as a lever for change to advance equity. Victoria also shared this slide right before uh, the panel began, but it's kind of helped contextualize our conver upcoming conversation. Um, this is one illustration of how shifts in mindset can impact shifts in the system and in culture and behavior. Um, shared learning is one, one lever among many, and we have concurrent roundtable discussions going on about advocacy and policy, um, but shared learning is one lever to help create shifts in mindset systems and culture to advance equity. A brief context. Thanks, Sophia. So when we were um, starting pr to prepare for the roundtable today, Sophia and Stacy and I, um, and thinking about um, how we can share shared learning as a lever of change, um, the quest these are kind of the questions that we use to help frame what we wanted to share and, and what we wanted to ask and have you all uh, engage with us in today. And one of that, those questions was, what is the purpose of shared learning? And we thought about that. And for us at PESB, one of the purposes is to really just work as a team and bring in the assets of everyone and the diverse perspectives of everyone and the knowledge and styles of all of our staff and board members um, to achieve a certain goal. Um, and then we also thought about what types of shared learning um, have supported our collective action. Um, and, you know, we at PESB, we've worked with all kinds of shared learning from just collaboratively learning together as an internal staff and as an internal staff with our board to learning with and from external stakeholders through grants, pilots, work groups, just really do a lot of shared learning with um, um, those outside the agency as well, with those in, in the education system. Um, and then common threads, we, you know, we found that having shared experiences and learning and, and understanding and kind of establishing, you know, you've heard a lot of talk today, I think about, it's really all about relationships and establishing that common, um, you know, that common goal, that common understanding. Um, and that's what really helps us um, move forward to collective action and being able to take that to work towards equity for educators and students. So, so that framed um, the discussion um, that we, the little bit we wanna share with you and then hopefully that will frame the discussion today um, as well. So we wanna go ahead and give you just a couple of examples of our experiences and then open it up for discussion to learn from all of you what experiences you've had with shared learning and, and um, how we can use that collectively as a lever of change. Sure, um, and so thanks for that, Leoni. I do, we, we talked a lot about this and I think this um, time together here is an example of shared learning. Uh, it came together because Leoni and Sophia and I spent a lot of time talking about things and we just wanna share, um, I'm gonna share a little bit about our agency book study and then Leoni and Sophia are gonna jump in with some examples of how we've taken that shared learning from within our agency and applied it to our work. Um, with each other and also uh, outside of our agency. So I'll tell the story of the book study from my perspective and Leonie and Sophia, and um, I know there's a few other Pesby folks in the room, feel free to jump in. Um, but, you know, we do an agency book study. We've, we started uh, in February, 2020 with Beverly Daniel Tatum's book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And I do think many of us, I at least looked at this initially as like a critically important piece of our work and also as 
additional work to what we were already doing. Um, and I think it was really interesting to have that experience early last year because I, I did a lot of my own identity work, right, with the the um, with Dr. Daniel Tatum's book, and it gave me more information, and it gave me some tools I needed to engage in conversations that are really necessary to the work I do, and it made me realize that I have my own work um, that I need to do to continue to engage in these conversations. Um, but the this was really highlighted to me because our book study lasted through the pandemic. So we are reading this book about equity and historical um, challenges and like very uh, much, so much information and data that I felt like I should have known, but I didn't know. And I was reading it during, um, as the pandemic was unfolding, we were seeing these huge inequities in education and healthcare. And then May of 2020 happened and George Floyd was murdered. And um, we saw these huge protests in the street and we had a book study. I just was looking at the calendar. Um, we had a book study that same week of his murder. And I think if we hadn't started, I personally feel if we had not started this work in the book study, that we probably wouldn't have been able to really process that um, experience as a team and to think about how that impacts our work and not just our day-to-day -day deliverables, but like the mission of our agency. So for me, it was really both personal and professional and had a lot of impact on uh, my identity and the work that I'm doing. Uh, so then we moved into uh, Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And that was a totally different lens for me. And I had all this new information and all these new insights and just taking it back to the group. And we would work in small breakout rooms and really have a chance to kind of process things with each other and then take that to our larger work, which to me was just hugely beneficial. And I guess um, I would like to hand it over to Leonie and Sophia, but I think for me, this has really become, the book study seems, it seemed like an extra, and now it just seems so foundational to the work that we're doing, that we have a shared understanding, we have a shared topic, we have shared information, we have shared perspectives, um, and that we can use each other now as resources to kind of how we apply that to our work. And then, sorry, I know I just said I was going to hand it over, but I was listening in the panel, and there were two quotes that stood out. So. Dr. Amy Riken said, um, this work is an ongoing process of engagement and expanding collaboration over time. And I think the book study does that. And Dr. Um, Helen Leichner said, as a collective, we can always move this work forward. And I just think it's so important, like this is what the book study means to me is that I have colleagues who support my learning and support my ability to do this work. Thanks, Stacey. Um, yeah, and I would just echo everything that you, that you said. Um, uh, the other book you see on here, um, all, besides just as a large group, some of us just do book studies also with each other or other type of studies. And the one on the very right, deculturalization um, and the struggle for equality, um, I've been doing with Erica um, and just learning so much. So, and I know that other staff members are doing other shared learning together. So um, I have so many examples, but I want to allow you all time to share too. So I'm just going to share one today. but. One of the examples I wanted to share about shared learning and kind of how we use that to make changes or, or can use that um, beginning to make changes um, is from the book, We Want to Do More uh, Than Survive, um, Bettina Love's book, um, Abolitionist Teaching and the Pursuit of Educational Freedom. And one of the things, I think one of the things that really struck me from that book was in chapter three, she really shared her personal experiences and a vital need for a community of support for her and not just for her but for all students of color and educator of colors how important that whole community is is and how we really need to bring community into education and into the work um, and so I think that was one thing we learned and then at the very same time our professional learning grants uh, that I work with have been going on. And for those of you who, I don't know if any of you were attended, Julie's here and has been in the professional learning uh, grant. They've had the grant for a couple of years. We've really learned from, um, we had three groups that actually did more like educators of color, um, professional learning communities around the grant. And um, Julie's group with Cary Institute and then Kent Educators of Color Network and Puget Sound ESD. And, so we were hearing and learning together the same thing from them. So as staff, we're learning 
this information in the book. And then with the grantees, we're also learning the same thing. They're really telling us how much this community is needed for educators of color and how much of a, a healing space it is. And so um, just one tiny little thing that it did for us was, was now in our, our next uh, grants that are coming up, it really prompted us to uh, do a couple of things, which does um, to require that the organizations in the next grant include educators um, who've been historically excluded from the education system. Um, and it also um, prompted us to allow for a grantee selected focus. So before we've kind of designated the focuses. Um, this year we're allowing for a grantee selected focus. And as applications are coming in, I'm seeing that some of the grantees are choosing affinity groups and ethnic studies and BIPOC leadership development. So it's just really exciting to see that, you know, what we're learning internally and then what we're learning externally from the grants and things um, that we can use those to just even little tiny changes, but to push forward, to, to kind of push on the system a bit and try to move forward towards equity. So, uh, Sophia, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to share as well. No, I think that was great, Leonie, and I want to make sure that we have enough time to engage together. Um, so thank you for that context, and I think if we feel good and maybe ready to move to discussion. Um, so these are guiding questions, and we'll open it up for um, all of you to also share your experiences and wonderings about shared learning um, as a lever for change. Um, but as these are guiding questions, so uh, they're on here to kind of like help prompt thoughts and discussion, but wherever you guys want to take this, or you all want to take this, um, please feel free. We don't have to go through these questions linear linearly um, or anything like that. So. Um, leave it up to all of you, um, but just in case I'll read them. So guiding questions are what experiences do you have with shared learning as a lever for change? Um, do you have any stories to share? Um, both perhaps stories of success and also stories of learning. Um, stories where something didn't go perfectly well and so um, you learned something from that experience. Um, what, might you, what might you need to learn to strengthen your work in this area? Who could support you with this learning? Whose learning could you support? and kind of future looking, how might you apply shared learning to your work? So these are our guiding questions. Um, I know I said that we can kind of jump around perhaps just to get us started. Um, maybe we can start with that first question. Uh, what experiences do you have with shared learning as a lever for change? And I open it up to all of you. And we're small, so go ahead and popcorn in as you feel like it. And Kayla, thank you for joining us. We just wanted just shared some guiding questions and we're opening up the discussion now for that first question. Hi, um, I can go ahead and share if that's okay. Um, so um, one, one really great experience that happened um, as a result of this year. So um, I mentioned that I work with Washington Alliance for Better Schools and we're just to give a little context to this. We're a collaborative of 12 school district in the 12 school districts in the Puget Sound area. And so I manage our family engagement program. It's really about equitable family engagement. And ordinarily what this looks like is that, um, or at least one aspect of this is that I am working directly with families through training. Um, in, in giving them tools and resources they need to take their rightful seat at the table in partnership in, in their school communities um, and take on leadership roles. And in the past, it's been, um, I, I, the trainings are specifically with families. Um, we've had issues where staff wants to come in as well and the power and positionality comes in play and stuff. And so we really want families to be able to have that space as their own. Um, but in this past year, when all of our trainings went virtual um, and, and after doing some, some other work in other districts, I felt like in this setting, I could kind of facilitate something where we could bring staff in. And so that families and staff were in the same training, learning the same type of things, having a shared vocabulary and really creating that shared learning experience. Um, and once we, you know, did some, some work just with the families and breakouts and just with staff and breakouts and recognizing, you know, all of the things, um, overwhelmingly the, the response to it was just so positive to have that shared space to learn together. Um, and, and especially for staff 
really. And, and we had teachers, we had principals, assistant principals, um, office managers, you know, the, the full gamut in there. And so having that, that space exist, setting in some protocols, being able to have that shared language and that opportunity for staff to just hear from families and, and share their experiences and their knowledge and their wisdom and, and that platform for them to do so was, um, it was just a really positive experience that I was really very lucky to, to be able to be a part of and, and facilitate. I'll jump in and piggyback on what you were saying, Jennifer, about bringing different stakeholders together. I find that some of the richest um, learning experiences I've had are those that engage people from uh, across the community. So I work with educators primarily, um, but when we're able to bring students and families into those conversations and into the shared spaces and shared conversation and dialogue, um, it's a much, much richer experience. Um, I would also say that I work primarily with educators who are working with students and families of refugee backgrounds. Um, and so there are lots of barriers to that in terms of time, in terms of language, in terms of culture, in terms of power and hierarchy and many, many other elements. Um, but one of the really interesting things in my current role is being able to bring educators together from across school sites and school districts, across state lines, across national boundaries. Um, and create opportunities for educators to learn from each other um, in, in very sort of uh, holistic and um, organic and grounded ways, right? So not always having an agenda, often having an agenda, not always having an agenda, letting the agenda be set as the conversation evolves, I think has been really, really important and really fruitful. Um, but I find that just to throw a challenge out there, and because I'm curious to hear other, how other people handle it, a challenge is certainly time. And so, you know, classroom teachers do not have time built into their day for these sorts of shared learning experiences. It's a very isolated and isolating profession where your shared learning is happening with your students in your classroom, certainly, but not necessarily with your colleagues or your peers, and certainly not outside of your immediate building or district usually. And so, and that really to me is a structural constraint and a time constraint. And I wonder how you all work to address um, those barriers as, as you approach creation of shared learning opportunities. Uh, how do we create time for people to engage? without burdening them further with additional work. I think for, I think about that too. So we're, you know, we're at the state uh, office and I think we're working to provide a lot of supports. And um, like you mentioned, Julie, what those supports become a requirement for participation and time. And what I have found is one of the biggest challenges is the folks who want to do the work are the ones primarily who are already overtaxed because they're so passionate and so committed. And it is difficult to ask, uh, to offer opportunities for shared learning when it is essentially more work. Uh, and so one of the ways that we, I think, try to do that from an organizational standpoint is to certainly be responsive to their time constraints. So it would be really inappropriate to schedule something for educators during the middle of the day and also working to provide funding for substitutes, professional development, like where can we provide financial incentives so their districts can support them in taking time out of the classroom to further this work. But I think you're asking the essential and important question of how do we, how do we do community work without placing more of a burden on folks who are already burdened by trying to do that work and impacted by it. So. I don't have an answer, but I do appreciate the question. <laughs> um, so my name is Kyla Crawford, and I am actually a teacher librarian in Thorndike at Thorndike Elementary. Um, the reason why I came today was actually happenstance. I um, I took a personal day, and I got an email from BESB because I uh, I was part of the committee. This actually the subcommittee that initially looked at career pathways for paraeducators when it was like before it was even a piece of actual legislation 
um, when it was like up, <laughs> up um, just being talked about by legislators and they developed a subcommittee uh, with, PE, with, PE, with PESB. And so um, I'm still part of the like emails that go out. So I was like, huh, equity grants, let me just go in and see what this is about. <laughs> Uh, and not realizing how many familiar faces I saw in here, like Janelle Adams is one of the people I worked with um, on that committee. And then um, I actually am highly connected to Antioch University because I'm part of their uh, community of, uh, what is it called? The CCA, so all these acronyms in education, right? Like com Committee of Community Advisors. Um, and have worked with their ArtC program, which is funded through the Advancing Equity Grant. Um, in addition to that, I've like, worked with the ECLC group, who also is a recipient of the grants. Um, so I found myself in this in this group, and um, I gravitated towards coming into this space because I am a Relationship Foundations person. Like, that's all that I think will change the world, right? It's creating relationships with each other. Um, so I also am on my district race and equity team. I run the race and equity team at my school. I'm on the district uh, uh, discipline team. Um, I've also been involved with uh, early educator and career, early career teacher work since we got an early career teacher position um, of support in our district. So this is great information to be bringing back to them uh and sorry to give you the book of my background but <laughs> i think it helps frame why i'm even in this space at all so when i think about this idea of time and uh and i've heard that a lot from especially from district admin that there just isn't enough time and i i think about i think about how we value uh how we value things, what, what we value in school districts or in uh, educator programs at any level, right? And oftentimes we associate, in a, in a white supremacist culture, we, we associate um, value with monetary. And then we talk about how time is money, right? So all of those three pieces are, are highly connected. And when... <laughs> I think about the things that a building admin decides to place their time and value in and pay for, right? Like what does a district admin um, decide to value and place time in? And so we, like I think about the staff meetings that we have, whether or not um, those are paid attendance or whether or not we, we are receiving clock hours, what the focus of those meetings is on, um, and so I've gotten in very early to my admin, my building admin, my district admin's ears and talking about how we need to compensate for staff meetings. We need to have a race and equity lens on each and every one of those. Um, and then for the race and equity work, for all of that work that we're already burdened doing um, and that we're already taxed and stressed out and at our wits end doing, but we still want to see it accomplished, uh, creating avenues for that to be compensated. Like none of my staff is going to show up to a, a race and equity meeting or any other meeting for that matter outside of contract hours unless it's compensated. And staff of color are not going to be retained unless their value is compensated. And so um, when we think about like what we're focusing our time on, it's, it's what are we putting money behind? <laughs> you know, most of the time it's what are we... <laughs> What time are we compensating? If we're telling you you've got to come, like it's not it's not mandatory. It's not mandatory. Mandatory. It's volunteer, and we're not going to compensate you for it. Nobody's going to show up, and it also shows us where the value is of that organization. Um, part of what Antioch did with their CCA grant funding was to basically create stipend or compensation for the time of educators and community members of color to mentor their candidates and their teacher prep program. So, hey, we can't hire staff permanently. Hey, we can't, um, we're not going to increase our recruitment and retention in the MAP program on, the, on campus, but we can bring in these community members and compensate them for their time. 
Yeah, that I've heard that. Um, I heard that earlier today too, and I think I think that's what I've heard over and over. It seems like, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, everybody is so busy, and then educators of color have even more put on them. Um, it seems like so. Yeah, that they have to feel, and we everyone has to feel valued because everyone has everything else going on in their lives too. I mean, I guess Kyla, I really appreciate that framing. Um, it makes me think too about, I have a lot of friends who are artists and who get asked to do things for free all the time. And it's like the value of the work that you create. And I wonder, and the idea of, you know, not to bring it back to the guiding questions, but because earnestly I'm, I am interested in this idea of how, what have you found success in that? And specifically, I mean, I think one of the things I heard you say too was, and I think of this, um, that that has to be woven into the paid time, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, justice work has to be woven into the the work that is there and it shouldn't be a, an add-on and it sh certainly shouldn't be like opt-in during your free time because it's never going to become the priority it needs to be but I guess I'm curious if you or Julie or Jennifer or Ashley if you all have um, found some strategies that work to kind of push that idea forward. So I don't really have um, because we're we're an outside organization that's working with districts. Um, oftentimes I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have access to make those types of changes <clears throat> on that level. But when I am meeting with, like I was meeting with an assistant superintendent just yesterday, who's, you know, wanting to implement this, this equitable family engagement on a, on a broader scale. And, you know, is really recognizing how we can't have this equity work done without families. It's not two separate things. It's, it's, it's interwoven. Um, and then we also can't put these structures in, in place if those that are, are doing the work are not compensated to do the work, whether it's going to a training or just adding something onto their job. And so I just you know, it told him, and he recognized it too, that it, it's, you have to be, you have to, if you're putting equity work as a priority for your district, for your school, it has to be fiscally prioritized as well and so that fiscal has to match up and so it's like you know really putting your your money where your mouth is and really getting folks to recognize that if we're if we're not doing that then everything is just going to kind of fall short and, and kind of be empty in, in that sense so um you know because for us anything that I'm offering it's the trainings that I mentioned before, they were on the weekend and the evening. So any staff that was going was going because they, they just really wanted to and they prioritized. And then we offered clock hours. So we're a clock hour provider and stuff. So that's about as much as I can do. But it's really speaking to those that have the power in the systems to to prioritize it in every way, including fiscally. Uh, but this isn't like a an answer or even really a question, but kind of makes me think of what you said in terms of Antioch, you know, being able to use a, a grant and a stipend to support, monetarily support this work. But stipends and grants are finite, right? Like that's not sustained. You can build sustainable structures through them, but, you know, it isn't built in, in a sustainable way inherently. Um, so it more kind of more of a, a comment, or I just like wonder you know, how to move from like the grant or the stipend to sustained options. I was just gonna, I was just gonna say that, uh, um, that Antioch has been working on this. So they're using the grant basically as a basis to collect evidence, right? Gather data and then say, hey, university, look at the, the progress that we've made. Look at the, uh, look at the, the outcomes, right? That have, that are resulting from having our CCA as part of this. We need to sustain this in all of our MAP programs at all of our campuses. Um, so I think that's part of this uh, shared learning, right? <laughs> like anytime we collect data, that is a shared learning. Like we're gathering ideas from experiences and then, you know, um, aggregating it in however, whichever way we do. Oftentimes it's quantitative, which bugs the heck out of me, but. You know, we're, we're putting it together as a story, whether it's a story of graphs, whether it's a story of, you know, anecdotal data, qual qualitative, like however it is, it's being used to share with somebody else to further an initiative. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways that, um, that 
shared stories, I think, is uh, strengthening this equity work. Um, and I think one of the ways that we're moving beyond grants, right, it's just gathering the story to be able to share. Um, I'm trying to think of other success stories. I think it, it's always, again, always relationship with me. So there are some brilliant ideas that I, that I have heard from some of my colleagues in my district that haven't been acted upon, which is where that leadership piece comes in. <laughs> um, that leadership and advocacy, uh, those two are tied together for me. But things like having people on a early release day or a late start day come out of their buildings and uh, just walk through the neighborhoods with each other and using our professional development time, our staff meeting time in that way, so that we're connecting with people from other buildings, that we are um, learning more about our neighborhood that we work in, because so often teachers come from another town, get in, get in the car, come into the, the school district area, get back in their car after leaving the building and go back to their home, which is in a totally different area of town. So they don't really understand culturally the experiences that uh, families and kids are having. Um, and so creating that narrative that enables, yeah, ena enables staff members and district members to be able to, um, to learn more about their communities that they're serving, uh, and then just sitting down and having conversation. Like, I think that should honestly be paid work. Uh, anytime colleagues, and I've been asked more than a few times, like, what should I do about this kid of color? Or like, I'm just butting heads with this in this situation. I don't know how to connect, you know, in X, Y, and Z ways. Like all of those pieces should be, those should be extra timesheet hours, like extra hours timesheets. I mean, like those should be <laughs> uh, billable hours of conversation and there should be a funding source for that. There should be a budget set aside just for, uh, PLC work or being able to use those side conversations um, in a school district, at least, uh, for um, OPAL or tri hours, like our clock hour work, or not clock hour, but our, the work that we have to do contractually that's not paid in the school district. <laughs> it's so interesting that you share that because um, both when you were talking and when Sophia was talking, I work on primarily on high school teacher academies, and there's a huge mentoring component to that. And so what's the easiest way to not pay someone for their time is to ask them to be a mentor, right? And so the legislature did something really great um, with the new bilingual educator initiative, which it's not super new, but it's been around in 2017. And they stipulated that these programs must compensate mentor teachers, right? So you're not going into your elementary and your middle schools and saying, hey, we know that you're passionate about equity and education. And so we want to we want to offer you this opportunity to engage, but like, hey, we know you're passionate about it and you can have a really big impact on these students. And also we value your time and we want to compensate you for that time. And so I just, I think like the question about, but these are grants, right? We're awarding grants. And so that grant money goes for two years and then they can apply for two more years. But how do you institutionalize that into your, um, into your district? And I think it's, it oh, keeps going back to leadership and the priorities and um, the line items that are built in there. And if these grow your own programs are going to work, there has to be more than just a, a grant for a couple of years. Yeah, that's also where relationships come in, right? Because that, that paraeducator career pathways idea came from one legislator. So I've heard, you know, one legislator who had a kid with autism who was highly disappointed with the services that their kid was being given at school. Oftentimes kids uh, that are in special education work one-on-one -on -one with paras throughout the day. And he was like, why is this unqualified person working with my kid all day? Paras should be highly qualified. And so all of this other legislation and career pathways and funding sources spawned from this one person having this story that sh was shared with another person and another person and created a committee and created, and they just happen to be, this is that leadership, they happen to be a person in, in power. They happen to be a person in leadership with that story. And so I think it can also work the reverse way, right? Where people who aren't stakeholders and, well, aren't recognized as stakeholders and systems of power can have conversations with that storytelling, that relationship, right? Like just sit down and talk to somebody else that whose story you're unfamiliar with so you can recognize the humanity in that person 
and see their struggle or see their perspective or see their experience and want to advocate for the same things just because they're right and only because you see that in somebody else. And so I think when we are, are we have these great ideas and then we're not connecting with the right people because it's that story in connection with leadership, right? Like everybody has to see each other's humanity. That's why I think conversations should be paid. Like I just wanna have coffee hour in my district. And actually Antioch with their grant money, they also started an educator of color program, not program, um, meeting space. And every person who attends that is paid. So we're literally paid to like go on a walk. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for sharing. I think unfortunately, you know, we're coming up on time. We're trying to avoid the same snafu uh, we had getting into these. Um, so we're gonna head back to the main session, but I just wanna thank you all so much um, for sharing your thoughts. I don't know if Sammy looking down because I was taking copious notes. Um, I think as Stacey said, this is an example of shared learning. I learned so much. So thank you from um, sharing your thoughts. And um, Kylie mentioned like making sure we're talking to the right people. Um, hope we can do that, you know? <laughs> so I, I look forward to taking these back and hopefully talking to the right people. But, um, thank you all.